We have also reached Renato Mariotti. He's a former U.S. federal prosecutor and the co-host of the podcast called It's Complicated. Uh, very, very apt in this case. Renato, Donald Trump just criticized the case as an outrage and said, quote, there is no case. He also said that many legal, legal scholars, I believe he said so many legal scholars are saying that this case is not meritorious. What is your assessment of that claim? Well, first of all, we're going to have an opportunity to assess those claims in the courtroom. And all of the bluster outside the courtroom is of very little value. At the end of the day, uh, the district attorney is going to have the burden of proof, and the evidence and the witnesses are what's going to matter. Okay, so that's the first thing. Uh, regarding legal scholars, uh, that's obviously overstated. Uh, look, Trump's uh, relationship with the truth is rather um, uh, tenuous at best. And so I'm not, you know, th that doesn't surprise me. Are there questions about this indictment? Sure. Are there criticisms that one could levy against the district attorney in this case? Yes. Um, but that said, uh, if I was representing uh, a, a defendant in this case, I would be concerned about a conviction. Uh, and ultimately, uh, I think Trump is concerned about a conviction as well. This is the first time that a former president will go on a criminal trial. What kind of a precedent does, does this set? Well, it's a, it's a, that's a really big question mm. uh, because I think one thing that's happened here, of course, is you have a, essentially a local prosecutor, a Manhattan prosecutor making a decision to indict the former president of the United States. I think there are legitimate concerns that this could lead to other prosecutions of other presidents. I do think that Donald Trump um, is in a very extreme example of a United States president. And he's so outside the box um, that he has created a lot of unprecedented situations uh, that um, uh, that are not entirely uh, that are that, that are not entirely uh, uh, you know attributable to his uh, adversaries. Uh, I think he has to take some responsibility for his own actions here. Yeah, big job for uh, Judge Juan Marchand. We were just uh, seeing pictures of him. Uh, Trump is charged with 34 counts of falsifying business records. He has pleaded not guilty. Some analysts have questioned whether the case is strong enough to have been brought forward in the first place, something that perhaps Donald Trump was alluding to uh, as he made those comments on his way to the courtroom. What are your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, I, I don't. I think the issue is not the quantum of evidence here. I actually think there is significant evidence in the case. In other words, th there's no question that there were false business records. In other words, there's no question that Michael Cohen uh, uh, was. You know, there's there's entries in the books and records that say that Michael Cohen was paid for legal services, and there's really no serious question that he didn't provide legal services, but in fact paid that money to. Stormy Daniels. I don't think there's any question about that. You know, obviously, there is still a question about Trump's state of mind and whether he was aware of those false entries. That is what the trial is going to be about. I think that the questions really surround whether this was the right case to bring, um, whether this merited prosecution. You know, prosecutors uh, don't have to charge every case that they could theoretically charge. I think those are legitimate questions. Um, I don't think that, um, however, the quantum of evidence on this fairly narrow charge of falsification of business records is really the issue. Tell me, uh, let's talk about jury selection. I was just asking our correspondent, Chris Reyes, about that as well. I mean, uh, how likely is it that they're about to find 12 people who have not heard of this case or not heard generally of, of Donald Trump's uh, illegal troubles? Given the nature of this case, the notoriety at the, of the man at the center of it, and frankly, the fact that everyone seems to have an opinion on it, positive or negative, how challenging is it going to be to select unbiased jurors here? Well, it's going to be less challenging than you think, because the standard is not quite what you've articulated. The standard is not that a juror has to have heard nothing about Donald Trump or nothing about this case or have no view on it whatsoever. That's not the standard. If it was, you're right. I don't know if there are 12 people in New York who, who would qualify. Um, but the standard is whether, despite whatever an individual has heard, whether they can put aside what they have heard and be fair and, and make a judgment based solely on the evidence in the case. In other words, the testimony and the exhibits. That's what the judge is going to ask. 
And if a juror says that they can be fair and the judge believes that or credits that, um, then that's going to be enough to seat the juror. And before I let you go, I mean, Donald Trump is the likely Republican presidential nominee. We know that it doesn't seem that the cases so far against him have impacted his popularity. This is different, though. This is a criminal case. Can this case impact his November run, his electability? Well, I wish I had that level of political uh, prognostication. Maybe I'd be in a different field. Instead of being a lawyer, I'd be a political analyst. I, I don't know. Uh, I, what I will say is I, I do find it remarkable um, that such a large percentage of the American public appears unconcerned uh, that a major party presidential nominee is facing uh, felony criminal charges. Thank you so much for your insights, Renato. We appreciate it. Thank you. Renato Mariotti is a former U.S. federal prosecutor and the co-host of the podcast, It's Complicated. Let's now bring in former U.S. federal prosecutor Jessica Roth. She's a law professor at the Cardozo School of Law and is the co-director of the Jacob Burns Center for Ethics in the Practice of Law. Jessica, thank you so much for making time for us today. It's my pleasure. Jessica, we heard from Donald Trump today on his way into the court courthouse. He calls this case an assault on America. He says it should have never been brought. Uh, he said that many legal scholars share that opinion, that it should have never been brought. From a legal perspective, what do you make of these statements? Well, it's what we would expect from the former president. Um, one thing that's significant is he's not going to be able to make that argument in so many words in the courtroom. Um, he's going to have to, his lawyers are going to have to contend with the evidence against him and with the specific charges, which are falsification of business records um, with intent to defraud. And it's been charged as a felony in this case. Uh, ordinarily, falsification of business records is just a misdemeanor, which is a lower uh, form of crime. But it can be a felony if the records are falsified with the intent to aid or conceal another crime. And the district attorney alleges that the records of the Trump organization were falsified um, with the intent to conceal uh, payments to Michael Cohen, the former president's former lawyer, to reimburse him for payments that Michael Cohen made to Stormy Daniels to cover up um, her allegations of having had an affair with uh, former President Trump. Um, she was ready to go public on the eve of the November 2016 presidential election. And so the allegation is that those payments to her uh, by Michael Cohen were actually contributions to Trump's presidential campaign because they were intended to uh, promote his campaign by keeping that damaging information under wraps. And those payments by Michael Cohen are alleged to exceed the donations that an individual is permitted by federal campaign finance laws. Uh, to make to any particular candidate's campaign. So it's complicated in that sense. We have this underlying offense that allegedly is furthered by the concealment in the Trump records, um, and Trump alleged to have played a role in that falsification. Jessica, I want to talk to you about Donald Trump's defense strategy here. Uh, I mean, so far we have usually seen him kind of delaying things. This is a different case than some of the others. How do you think the hush money case will differ from the other cases against him where he has pushed for every possible delay? I mean, we have already seen uh, his team question whether Judge Juan Marchand should be uh, uh, in this court, whether he has conflict of interest. So I feel like we're seeing already the inklings of, of, of the strategies that will be at play here. But what do you foresee as we get into this court case? Well, to be clear, the former president and his attorneys have tried to delay this trial as well. Uh, they just haven't been successful in doing so to the same extent here as they have been in Florida, where the judge um, has been very reluctant to move forward um, on an expeditious basis with the uh, the case that involves his willful retention of, of national security information. In the District of Columbia, D.C. case brought by the special counsel, that case is on hold while a claim of presidential immunity is before the United States Supreme Court. Um, and in the Georgia case, which is a sprawling RICO conspiracy involving numerous other individuals, there's been no trial date set yet. Um, so this is the one that is going to trial. Um, really mostly first, uh, mostly because those other cases have been so delayed. But again, this one, also Trump has 
endeavored to delay. He just hasn't been successful. But he's going to be attacking, I think, primarily Michael Cohen as a key witness for the prosecution and Cohen's credibility. Um, he may also argue that he had no connection to any scheme to uh, falsify the Trump business records. And I think that it's maybe a challenge for the district attorney to connect Trump to the falsification of the records. And then finally, he may also claim that those payments to Stormy Daniels were to further his personal interests, essentially in protecting his marriage and not his political campaign. Do you think Donald Trump is likely to take the stand in, in this court case? I know he has said that he plans to. I think that's unlikely because it is frequently um, strategically uh, harmful for a defendant to take the stand in their own defense because they can be cross-examined so extensively with their prior statements and prior conduct. Um, in this case, uh, Trump may decide that it's worth it to him so that he can make his case uh, to the jury directly and also indirectly um, to the American people. So it is hard to predict what Donald Trump will do. Um, he's a very unusual person um, in so many ways and including in how he behaves um, in these trials being brought against him. So I'm going to wait and see what he chooses to do. But certainly the cross-examination will be extraordinary if it happens. Jessica, just uh, one final question. We know that this case involves charges of white-collar crime. So far, Donald Trump has claimed that all his legal troubles will not hurt his standing with Americans. He is the presumptive Republican nominee. As things stand right now, do you think that this case could hurt his presidential chances come November? You know, I, I can't really opine on the politics of the situation. I do know that he seems to have, uh, in many ways, uh, raised funds um, from his supporters whenever he is a uh, party to a proceeding against him and he portrays himself as the victim. Um, it really depends on what the outcome is here, what the verdict is, uh, whether he's found guilty of a felony. That may move some people um, who are open to being moved, but it does seem that there are, are many of his supporters who do not seem to care uh, what happens in these various criminal trials. We shall see. Jessica, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your expertise with us.